Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get rolling here. Welcome, welcome. You have reached the webinar with noted performance yacht designer Doug Zern. This is sponsored by MJM Yachts Day. We'd like to welcome all of you. We really appreciate your time, and I think you're going to enjoy our little presentation here with lots of interesting and I have to say really cool information about what goes into uh, making yachts do what we all just take for granted when they're out there on the water. So I'll just do a quick little introduction here. Uh, many of you have heard of Doug Zern and I would put money on the fact that maybe a hundred years from now um, you'll have Harishoff on one side and Zern on the other. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I think that's a fair bet. Um, Doug's native to the Great Lakes region of North America, uh, grew up sailing. Uh, we won't hold that against him because most of us started sailing before we got into power boats. And, um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with boat building um, or who are familiar with boat building and design, you may appreciate the fact that Doug absorbed all of Skeen's elements of yacht design by the time he was 17. And then he went on to receive his professional degree in yacht design with honors from the West Lawn School of Yacht Design in 1993. And right after that is when he established Zern Yacht Designs. So a lot of us have seen Doug at the boat shows. We've, we've spoken to him briefly before. Um, you can look around and see a lot of his designs from sailboats to powerboats, uh, most notably MJMs, building a boat for Billy Joel, Lyman Morris, uh, all kinds of others. Um, so we're really excited and uh, Looking forward to having Doug with us and take us through some things here today. So Doug, if you don't mind, I'll kick it off with the question that we hear most, um, and I'm sure you do as well. What makes a stable hull? Chris, thanks very much. And uh, everybody, thanks very much for coming today. I have to be reminded of a seminar I did a few years back in Newport with Power and Motor Yacht, in which case uh, there were just two attendees, uh, one of whom was my wife. So I'm grateful for you all to show up. Chris is gonna sort of mitigate the cursor over to my side of things. And as soon as we have that, we'll get started. I am, here we go. You yeah. have the helm. All right, thank you. Thanks again, Chris. So again, um, as Chris mentioned, I grew up sailing my entire life as a kid. Um, probably my first uh, first experience uh, with stability was likely in a small dinghy, sailing and capsizing, uh, learning the understanding of uh, gravity in the center of gravity in a, in a little dinghy uh, certainly teaches you a lot about that immediately. And it also teaches you how critical gravity in the center of gravity is in, in a boat. Um, with uh, the higher speeds involved, power boats stability is far more dynamic. Uh, if instability exists, it can be far more catastrophic. You all uh, may have seen the high speed cigarette boat in the Lake of the Ozarks in a video that was going around a few years ago where uh, instability set in and it was uh, catastrophic. I, no one got seriously hurt, but it's certainly not what we wanna be doing uh, when we're out on a pleasure boat. So in the next few minutes, uh, I'm gonna try my best to explain to you what makes a hull stable. Uh, for me, this is very intuitive. So if in the end I haven't made it clear, um, please feel free to ask a question or send an email at a later date, or even better, uh, give me a call, and I'm happy to, uh, talk, to talk to you about it. Um, before I talk about stability, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, uh, the six degrees of motion um, that are involved. Uh, and, and they are surge, heave, uh, roll, pitch, yaw and sway. Um, roll is probably the one we're most familiar with. It's what we encounter when we're sitting on a boat uh, in displacement mode, that is at rest or at, at idle. Um, 
heave and surge are also uh, components that we feel as we're running uh, through waves. And, and these two combination um, probably um, most influence how we feel on a boat when we're running. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, pitch, of course, is uh, the up and down motion of the bow. Sway is side to side. And yaw is uh, the boat twisting in this sort of direction, which could result be a result of uh, uh, wave conditions and sea state. Um, and it's easy to experience all six of these uh, at once, given the sea state. Um, depending on the design, um, they can certainly attribute to fatigue and sickness. So when we design a boat and when we talk about stability, um, we need to take all of these six motions into consideration, not just what I may have learned about stability growing up on a little dinghy. So um, probably, again, as I mentioned, what we're most familiar with is roll. Being comfortable at rest is paramount to being comfortable on a boat while cruising. Um, pictured here are two MJMs in the Abacos. Um, definitely a place I'd like to be quarantined right now. Um, but uh, at rest, roll is probably the most noticeable of the six degrees of motion. And form stability plays a critical role in preventing that. So form st stability is the result of a number of design factors which influence high-speed, hard-chined powerboats, transverse stability, side to side that is. And waterline beam is probably the most influential factor. Um, the term roll period I'll refer to defines the time in seconds it takes for a boat to be in equilibrium, heel to port, heel to starboard, and heel back to centerline again. And it's a way of us determining uh, the comfort level uh, and of, of a boat. So a narrow waterline beam uh, will result in a fairly low initial transverse form stability and a long roll period, so back and forth. Increasing waterline beam will increase initial stability and will shorten that roll period. The one thing we want to avoid is we don't want to induce too much deep beam into the design of a boat because that'll make for a very short roll period, make for a very stiff, stiff boat. Um, you know, if any of us have been on a sailboat in a harbor without a rig on it and tried to walk around it, um, that's the sort of stiff motion I'm talking about that we want to avoid. So there wants to be some sort of give to it. Um, the recent introduction of gyro stabilizers certainly have uh, found their way into the pleasure boat market and have significantly reduced uh, the roll period by as much as 95%, which is uh, increases our comfort level on boats. Uh, they're a nice feature. Um, for a given displacement, um, dead rise also plays a role in a uh, key part in form stability. Um, deep feed boats draw more water, uh, draw more draft rather. And so for a given displacement, if you've got a 26 degree dead rise boat versus an 18 and a half degree dead rise boat, that 26 degree dead rise boat is going to need a narrower waterline bead. Thus that boat will have a longer roll period and wouldn't be as stable. Um, initial form stability defines where a hull's center of gravity is, uh, center of rotation. Let me go to the next slide here. That's the, called the meta center. And this is, this is the point around which a boat would rotate. The centroid has to be above the center of gravity in order for a boat to float upright. The higher the meta center, the higher the hull's initial stability. Its relationship to the center, vertical center of gravity is another factor in a boat's stability. The further away the VCG is from this meta center, the stiffer the boat. So naturally a lower center of gravity will increase stiffness in a boat. And it's a balancing act between these two. Again, we don't want it too stiff and we don't want it too rolled. So let's look at 
dynamic stability. So this is form stability, this is at rest. Dynamic stability is in motion. Chris, could you fire up that image of the 40Z running off Palm Beach for me? Absolutely, Doug. <clears throat> So I know many of you have probably, um, these are pretty rough conditions here. Many of you have probably seen these videos of the 40Z running off, uh, off the coast of Florida and Palm Beach. Um, these are pretty rough conditions to be running at any speeds, but you can see the motion is gentle and not that snappy. It's a little difficult because the video isn't running straight on full. But in this case, form stability has given away to dynamic stability. Dynamic st stability for high speed, hard chine power boats can be defined by the characteristics that allow a boat to perform in a stable and predictable manner while on plane. A stable and predictable manner while on plane. So in order to understand this, we have to understand the important effect of the dynamic forces generated by increased speed, known as lift. As a hull approaches planing speeds, lift is generated in the forward sections of the hull bottom, causing the bow to rise. In this instance, the center of lift is occurring forward. As the boat builds speed, that center of lift moves aft until the forces of the lift overcomes the weight of the boat or the displacement of the boat, and the hull lifts entirely out of the water onto a plane. At this point, the dyna dynamic lift is supporting the hull and its relation to the center of gravity plays a key role in the dynamic stability of the boat. Yeah, we're gonna go to the next slide, Chris. All righty. Okay, um, so we talked previously about the vertical center of gravity. Now we're gonna talk about the uh, longitudinal center of gravity. Where is the gra center of the weight of the boat fore and aft? Um, in this case, we examine the longitudinal center of gravity and determine how a boat will perform uh, by calculating the relationship between the area bound by the chine, which is this area here, and the longitudinal center of gravity. So as you can see, the center of, air, the, center of the area of this chine area is forward of the LCG. Um, its relationship is what determines whether a boat will run stable at planing speeds. As an example, if the LCG is too far forward um, or the lift is too far aft, it could set up an oscillating instability known as porpoising, which I mentioned earlier, the up, up and down of a bow. Um, so you may have experienced this. Uh, if you run an outboard boat and you trim it up a little bit too high, um, the, the bow might start oscillating up and down and, and uh, just trimming it back down a scooch will we'll get rid of that. And, and basically that position as it's running is probably the most efficient position for that particular boat to run in as far as if fuel economy and speed. Um, it's where uh, you've got the right amount of balance of lift over under the, the uh, longitudinal center of gravity and, uh, and the least amount of wetted surface underneath the boat. Um, contrary, if you've got too much tap on or engines down, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be increasing drag and, and resistance of the boat and, and, and it won't be as comfortable, most likely. Um, if the LCG is too far aft, um, we could set up another sort of oscillating motion known as uh, chime walking. Um, this is when the boat will, will literally start getting uh, out of control back and forth till it, it, it can become catastrophic. And again, these are things we wanna try to, try to avoid.
So uh, I'm, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about bottom loading here. Um, on high-speed planing hulls, uh, the two motions that affect passengers the most I mentioned earlier were, um, and really are, are indicative of good and bad design are heave and surge. And um, um, excessive acceleration and deacceleration in these two directions contribute most to human fatigue and really uh, make for an uncomfortable ride. Uh, hull designs that minimize this obviously uh, are what we are after. Um, narrow chine beams relative to length and fine entries are two design characteristics um, that help reduce these motions. Um, combine this with distribution of the weight of the vessel over the uh, area of the planing surface of the hull in a manner that produces favorable bottom loading characteristics will generate a ride that maximizes comfort in most sea states. Um, in, in this example, uh, we're using Donald Blount's uh, dynamic stability program and, and consider the previously mentioned uh, area of the waterline uh, chine area uh, bound and its center uh, forward of the transom. And we factor in the chine beam um, here, so the beam of the boat at the chine, and then we include the various load values and load conditions that the boat might be running in light ship, uh, performance, and full load. Um, and in, in this way, we take a look at this and we're, we're able to optimize the hull design for stability. And in this case here, you can see we have our three uh, various load conditions here, uh, all of which are in the minimum integrated resistance area. So this is where uh, the, the, this particular boat will design, uh, will perform its best. Um, if we were to go through this exercise and find uh, these, these, these data points up in this high section here, it would indicate to us that the boat bottom is heavily loaded and this would likely be a slow boat a wet boat. Um, if contrary to that, if we were down in this area here, uh, the bottom uh, would be lightly loaded and, and uh, would probably slam and uh, the motion would be very uh, jerky up and down. Also, well, we're able to look at our longitudinal center of gravity locations here and see that where we are here at 14 feet forward of the transom, again, drops us into this, uh, into this green minimum integrated resistance zone here. If that center of gravity on the hull came out further forward than it is two feet forward, we get into this area here where uh, this becomes a very dangerous situation where the mentioned earlier, the boat could trip over its bow um, and broach. Uh, again, uh, dynamic instability would set in and uh, it's something we want to avoid. So the last two uh, motions we want to talk about today, uh, well, actually, let me just talk about this before I get too carried away here. Uh, of course, boats turning. Um, when, we, uh, when, we, when we bank into a turn um, on, a, on a high speed planing power boat, generally you want the boat to lean into the turn. It does this because the, the back end is able to slide out um, and your, your inertia is pressed down into the cockpit sole versus having the boat roll out uh, and your inertia getting thrown out of the boat. This is typical uh, of a, uh, a low-speed boat that may have had too much power put in it. Boat, boats with keels generally uh, aren't good for high speed. Uh, the boats tend to trip over themselves, over the keels. Uh, the keels offer too much directional stability and don't let the boat slide out from underneath in a turn and bank properly into a turn. So uh, hence, we, we don't have keels on our high-speed uh, power boats. So uh, again, the, the last two are yaw and sway I wanna talk about. Um, uh, on high-speed hauls, it's important to incorporate a moderate degree of dead rise into the bottom surface and uh, moderate dead rise helps maintain directional stability. That's the ability of the vessel to maintain a straight course. 
um, without compromising its ability to roll into a turn, as I just talked about. And we consider uh, dead rise is, of course, this angle back here. Um, we consider moderate dead rise to be between 13 and 23 degrees. And most of our boats that we've designed, high speed uh, power boats, are in that range. Um, on semi displacement and displacement vessels, dead rise angles are typically less, and a small to large keel is usually incorporated in the design to offer directional stability at low speeds. Um, finding the proper balance between speed, directional stability, and low speed maneuverability are key. In all cases, um, care must be taken um, to not have too much uh, bow, uh, a too, too deep a forefoot at the forward end of the boat, especially on high-speed planing boats. Um, all of our hulls actually have a little bit of rocker up forward. Uh, we start about back here and we start bringing the profile of the boat up here a little. And what this does is it frees the bow up a little bit in following seas when you're running down waves you can trim the bow up a little bit, or even if you don't, it doesn't dig in as much as a deep four-footed uh, bow would on a, on a slower boat and uh, you know, make your ride uncomfortable. And again, set up a potential for a, a brooch. Um, and uh, so that's, that's pretty critical there. And then in the following seas, um, so, and that helps prevent, I mean, that's, that's the, uh, yaw motion, I mean, that helps keep the boat going in a straight track and, and comfortable. Um, Chris, could you start that 36C video for me? Absolutely, Doug. Thanks. <laughs> So we rarely get to run a, in these conditions, uh, but I wanted to show this. You can see how wonderfully balanced the 36C is here as my friend Mark and I transit the Kalasahatchee uh, River down in Florida. Um, Scott Smith took this video of us as we were delivering a 40Z and a 36C from Palm Beach to Naples a few years back. Um, the trim angle is correct. You can see the cut waters in the right location. The lifting strakes are doing their job of throwing the water down and uh, generating some air under the bottom to reduce resistance. And overall, this is how a boat should properly run um, in these conditions. And you don't often see this in rough conditions because of the other uh, 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 because of the other motions that are involved that we discussed earlier. So um, that's that's it. Uh, I, I hope you found this informative uh, from a stability standpoint and understanding how a boat rocks and rolls. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, feel free to reach out with any questions or comments you may have. Um, Chris can share my email with you and should you not have it. Um, so. Thank you for coming. Um, wash your hands often. Don't touch your face. And if you'd like, contact my one of my favorite yacht brokers, Linda Ward in East Coast Yacht Sales, and she'll make one of these fancy Zern Yacht Design fabrics, has all my designs on it, uh, masked for you. All right? Thanks for coming, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you, Doug. Thank yep. you. That was awesome. It's, uh, it's great to have somebody with knowledge, especially when we realize, wow, uh, we just thought you, you know, picked up crayon and, and drew some stuff together, make it look good at a boat show. There's far more behind it, obviously. Um, you had mentioned one thing. We have a few questions that came in uh, via email. When you were showing the upside down hull design, you talked about how you add rocker, um, but then you also mentioned the fact of uh, a hull being beamy. So what is it? What do we as boaters, what should we expect when we're at a boat show or we're on a boat, we go down below and we see a large, expanded, very wide beam full forward? Now, is there a negative effect to that or a positive effect? Well, I mean, that's actually, it's uh, probably indicative of a boat that's not going to run particularly well. Uh, 
uh, I, 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 I mean, it's easy to walk around a boat show and just look at look at the cut where the water line at the at the bow and just take a look at the angle of the entry there. Um, and uh, if you go into the forward cabin of a boat and it's got this huge king size bed up forward and very uh, a lot of room up there, obviously it's it's probably not going to be a great running boat. It might be a very comfortable boat to sleep on, uh, but it may not you may not be a boat you want to take out in conditions that aren't so great or get caught out in conditions that aren't so great. Okay, good helpful info. Here, here's another question then. This is uh, from Jeremy, and forgive me for looking down and reading it. Um, with the continuing development, performance, and popularity of outboard engines applied to traditional hull designs, is there a risk of outrunning the natural uh, sweet spot for the 40Z, the 50Z, or other hull designs? Are those hulls really performing um, as you had designed a hull at speeds of 50 miles an hour? And if so, what's the upper speed design limit of those classic hulls? Uh, <clears throat> so the since uh, the inception of MJM, uh, the, we designed the boats to be 50 mile an hour boats plus um, the, the 34Z, the hull number one, uh, we designed it for twin engines and uh, founder Bob Johnson decided he just wanted one engine. And then we learned that, hey, this boat runs great with one engine. It's really efficient. And, uh, but they've always been designed as, you know, to with the potential of going 50, uh, 50, 50 knots. And uh, when we look at uh, ISO category A ratings, uh, we are designing the hull laminates and structure for that speed. Um, I would say that if if uh, if our boats are going to be generally uh, traveling above 50 knots all the time, you could probably do some things that might be a little different. But um, I'm really uh, the uh, idea and philosophy that design a boat for how it's used 90% of the time, and 90% of the time we're running at speeds of less than that. Um, and um, I think a good stable foundation uh, on, on which to to enjoy that time on the water is more important than maybe a little bit more efficiently you might get out of a step tall or something like that, which is might be better at 60 or 70 miles an hour, but um, I just don't see the MJM clientele going there. Okay, and we have another question from um looks like Stefan, how come your hulls, whether it be MJM, Vanquish, or other brands, are so efficient when compared to other boats of similar size and weight? Um, I, I think it has to do with uh, what I was talking about earlier, and that's the waterline beam and dead rise angles, and it's a balancing of that. It's materials, using the right materials in the right places. Um, and and um, just the combination of everything, really. Uh, the, the you know the dead rise angle is a key component to the success, I think, of the efficiency of many of our designs. We don't go for deep dead rises aft. We we go for a, a moderate dead rise aft. Uh, we have a, a a fairly deep dead rise forward, uh, where the cut water is, and further forward than that. Um, we also, I think, if you look. Uh, our um, our our hull's weight is distributed uh, further along lengthwise uh, the length of the boat compared to other boats that may have stems that are much steeper. So their their forward end of their boat, their waterline may start here and go to here. So they're actually trying to get the same amount of displacement in this shorter of a waterline length where we have a longer waterline length. So like our 40 footers waterline length is considerably longer than uh, on the extreme other end of things, uh, Reggie Fountain or a cigarette waterline length. Okay, cool. Here's another question from Dave. Um, his is about the uh, 50 to the 53. So what were the challenges and how did you overcome them going from the 50Z to the 53Z? Uh, honestly, the biggest challenge was just satisfying U.S. Coast Guard gas regulations. Um, Weight-wise, uh, 
moving uh, moving uh, 12,000 pounds of engines from here to 6,000 pounds of engines back here didn't change uh, the L LCG of the boat, um, and that's uh, it's all uh, it's all about foot pounds. So um, this is a moment. This is a moment here. It's a it's a 32,000 pound foot pound moment with these lighter engines back here. It's also a 32,000 pound foot pound moment. So the two those two traded off. Um, we generally like to design our boats so that our fuel tanks are centered around the LCG or the LCB, which usually, hopefully, are right over each other. Um, so that way, as fuel is consumed, the boat will just raise out of the water. It won't trim down or trim up. Um, so those two things, um, the boats were already sort of designed that way. And um, it was when we first converted the 40 to a 43, I was, uh, very happy to call Bob and Peter and say, guys, this is very doable. So it worked out very well. Okay, another question. This one's a throwback here. Um, how do the new MJM designs compare with the original 34Z with the prop pocket? Um, well, a uh, couple of ways. Um, bottom wise, obviously you have some more running surface back aft, some more lift surface back aft. So generally speaking, the newer mod, the, the, the newer boats will run probably a little uh, flatter than the 34Z would. Um, <clears throat> we, we started uh, with the 29Z and the 40Z placing the engines aft in the boat that got uh, all that vibration and noise out from underneath the bridge deck. And then also that eliminated the step through the bridge deck. So we we ended up with this flush deck, which was a, a wonderful arrangement. From a performance standpoint, um, the bottoms, the waterline beams, the relationship between the waterline length and the waterline beam, uh, those relationships change. Uh, didn't excuse me, they didn't change a whole lot. Um, dead rise angles have pretty much remained the same. We've improved some things uh, on later boats to help keep them as dry as we can possibly keep them, and also to try to avoid chine slap when uh, the boats are at rest. When So when you're trying to sleep on the boat, you don't hear as much chine slap, so. All right, well, Doug, thank you very much for your time. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if we could, we could do a round of applause, but I have everybody on mute so Doug wouldn't hear it. Uh, but again, if you have questions and you wanna send them to Doug, Doug, can I give out your email address? Doug at zernyachts.com. There we go. Thank you, everybody. And on behalf of MJM Yachts, thank you for joining us today as we have world renowned naval architect, lead designer, soon to be super famous everywhere <laughs> in the world if he isn't already, Doug Zern. Have thank a good day, everyone.